Hello, my name is Stephanie McEwen Samuels. I'm the Regional Director of Sales for MongoDB. Um, I'd like to thank the National Sales Network for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you, you know, college students as you're starting to think about um, the beginnings of your career and kind of getting out on your own and starting your adult life. So I'm really excited to share with you some of the lessons that I have learned on the way. So I'm going to um, deliver 10 lessons that I put together. Um, I'm gonna deliver it in the David Letterman style, the top 10. So without further ado, um, these are the top 10 lessons that I have learned that have shaped my career and my adult life. So lesson number 10, you are not a label. So I grew up in the 70s and for college students, I know the 70s seemed like a very long time ago, and in fact it was, but I grew up in the 70s in the western suburbs of St. Louis. And our family wasn't the first black family in the suburbs, but we were one of, of only a handful. And my parents really did a great job of ensuring that myself and my two brothers had as close as an idyllic life or childhood as possible, kind of given the circumstances. And so like as a kid, I really didn't understand um, what it means to be labeled. I didn't really associate any kind of value to color of skin, didn't think of difference, et cetera. And it wasn't until around the fourth, thing, the fourth grade that things started to kind of change for me in this regard. So um, keep in mind, this is now like the late seventies, there was no internet, there was no email. So all communication between the school uh, and the families were sent through the children. So my school had something called oldest and only. And that was at the end of the day in your homeroom, they would call for oldest and only and the oldest child in the family or the only child in the family would receive the communications to send home to their parents. So it was around fourth grade that they called oldest and only and I went up and as I was going up, I overheard two classmates kind of giggling and snickering about the fact that the reason why I was going up was not because I was the oldest or only child, but because I was the only black in the school. And so at that point it began, I began to learn that there was a label called black. So fast forward two decades and I find myself working in my first technology sales role. I worked for an amazing company selling CAD CAM technology. And I had the territory of like central and Southern Illinois. So kind of let me set the stage here. Now we're talking about the late twenties um, in this tech company. There was another woman there that I knew of. Um, I did not know of, of any African-Americans. So when it comes to like being a minority, I was kind of going it alone. And my job would entail me calling on these manufacturing companies in the middle of like, middle of nowhere, Illinois, trying to secure face-to-face -face appointments. So I would cold call, um, when I would cold call these contacts, the only thing that the person on the other line really knew about me was that I was a woman because they could tell that from my voice. Of course, you know, as is natural, they made assumptions about me um, from the sound of my voice and from my last name, McEwen. So um, in their minds, they probably had me pretty well sized up. So imagine the look on people's faces in, you know, Quincy, Illinois, Troy, Illinois, Effingham, Illinois, when I show up, you know, they're expecting, you know, Susie Cutie Patootie and, and, and walks Oprah. I mean, I can't tell you um, how many times in that period that I literally wanted to pick people's jaws up off of the floor because I did not fit in their box at all. I did not fit into their label of tech salesperson. I did not fit into their label of woman and I did not fit into their label of black person. You know, I'm not gonna lie in that there's been times when, you know, walking into a conference room or presenting to a large group of executives, um, attending a big conference where I would look around and I would see not a single black person in the room. And oftentimes I was the only woman. And at times, you know, that could be scary and, and, and overwhelming. And in some experience, you know, 
could have even incapacitated me, except for this fact. I chose, and I still choose, to not let the label of woman or not let the label of African American define me. In fact, I use that label and I have used it to my advantage. Think about it. You know, in sales, one of the hardest challenges we deal with is differentiating ourselves from one another. And I know when I walk through the door, I am automatically different. I'm already super unique. So I have changed my perspective on this. And instead of letting that label of woman or the label of African-American, which someone perceive as a disadvantage, instead of allowing that to be a disadvantage, I have learned to use that as an advantage for me. And so that brings me to my next lesson though. Um, the next lesson, lesson number nine, in my list of things that I have learned in my career is work ethic. So living outside of the label and establishing how you're gonna define yourself is not enough. You know, rightly or wrongly, when I grew up in the 70s and 80s and when I started my career in the late 1990s, early 2000s, you know, and even now, black and brown people um, in every aspect of our lives are held to, to a different standard. And, you know, all you have to do is turn on, on the TV or the news or research police arrests and incarceration or look at pop, popular culture and you'll see that what I'm saying is true. You know, as college students, I'm guessing that you probably have your own personal experiences where you have seen um, the difference in our education system. So you probably already know that what I'm saying is true. So, you know, as you begin your career journey um, and your journey as adults, you have to remain cognizant that our world is not yet fair. And this will bleed into your work life. I mean, think about it. Even the most progressive companies are comprised of, of everyday people who bring in their worldview with them. Am I saying that corporate America is racist or sexist? Absolutely not. But I am saying that you must be aware of unconscious bias. In the book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent, Isabel Wilkerson defines unconscious bias as an implicit bias that operates and shapes behavior. This discriminatory behavior is activated more quickly and effortlessly than conscious discrimination. She further goes on to write, these autonomic responses contribute to disparities in hiring and housing, education, and medical treatment. Now, I did not need to read a book to know that unconscious bias had been in play in my life. And, and I suspect that all of you guys out there, you didn't need to read this book, you know, read a book either. Um, what I've learned though, is that through, uh, through work ethic, a good work ethic is something that is used to counterbalance unconscious bias. You know, growing up, I would, I would bring home a C and my parents would be very angry and they would say, A, you're not performing to your potential. Uh, and B, and this is the most profound statement, they would say to me, Steph, you cannot afford to be average. My parents in those moments were protecting me. They were planting the seed for me that a strong work ethic is what is gonna be required. In fact, it's gonna be my best shot at being successful and overcoming unconscious bias. You know, to this day, I attribute my success to work ethic, to working harder, working smarter, knowing more, being willing to make one last phone call, being willing to send one last email, closing one last deal, no matter how small, being willing to do more than the what, what the next person is willing to do. So as you start off your career, rightly or wrongly, please keep in mind that you cannot underestimate the value and the importance of a work, of a strong work ethic. The eighth lesson on my list of, of uh, things that has helped me in my career is that the most 
valuable resource that you have is time. Think about it. Time is much more valuable than money. You can always make more money, but you cannot make more time. There are only 86,400 seconds in a day, and one is only given so many days. This becomes particularly important for you as you begin planning your careers because your time is so valuable. Only work for organizations and people who are exceptional. Research and find organizations that are going to push you to be your best, that are known for developing talent, that truly believe in the strength that of the organization is in the strength of their people. This is why I'm at MongoDB. I mean, our data platform is undeniably exceptional. It's exceptional technology. But more than that, we have exceptional people across the board in all areas of our company. And these exceptional people operate at a higher level than the vast majority of other companies. This is what makes us awesome. This makes us better as individuals and makes our company better as a whole. This is what you must look for as you're starting your career because you don't want to spend a decade of your time or even a year of your time working for or working with average people, working with B players, working for an organization where they're okay with folks just kind of phoning it in. That will not make you better. That will not allow you or help you to grow faster. Keep in mind, iron sharpens iron. So go find the best company and work for them. Notice, I did not say go find the easiest job that pays well. I said, give your time to the best company you can find. Give your valuable time only to those organizations who deserve it. When it comes to working, when it comes to your career, right now and throughout your career, you should be thinking quid pro quo. You should be thinking, I will give my valuable time in exchange for development, in exchange for leadership opportunities, in exchange for training, for mentoring, for an opportunity to create wealth, not just make money. Uh, and by the way, I just like to, to say that MongoDB is hiring and we are looking for people just like you. Although at this phase of your life, you may be thinking I'm short on work experience, but here's what you are. You are long on energy. You're long on fresh new ideas and you are long on time. This fundamental understanding of the value of time is something that I wish that I would have learned at your age, and that is why it's made it to my top 10 list. This brings me to the seventh lesson on my top 10 list, and that is beware of crabs in the bucket. So I'm from Missouri. My folks are from um, Arkansas and Tennessee. So growing up, I heard all sorts of old Southern sayings, and this was one of them, beware of crabs in the bucket. When there's a single crab in a bucket, it endeavors to escape to freedom, and depending on the size of the bucket, it succeeds. When there's more than one crab in the bucket, as soon as one crab tries to escape, the others pull at its legs to keep them down. You may have already seen this in your own world experiences, your own life experiences. I know at your age, I had already seen this phenomenon. I had countless people say to me, uh, why are you talking like, you know, why do you act that way? Why do you think you're better than everyone else? When I was younger, comments like that really confounded me and even hurt my feelings. And looking back through the lens of time and through the lens of maturity, I recognize exactly how sad those statements were. Those statements were in essence saying, as black and brown people, we belong at the bottom of the barrel. We are, we belong in a situation where we're unable to move, unable to, esca to escape our lot in life, unable to improve. you know, How dare you have the audacity and the arrogance to think that you can make yourself better? Um, as you are establishing yourself as adults um, and establishing your careers, I just caution you against being anywhere near this crab mentality. In fact, there's two specific aspects I want you to think about if you think of crab mentality. One, do not surround yourself with crabs. 
your potential and your future is too great to spend your valuable time with people who would rather nip at your heels and hold you back than encourage you. I fully understand that this may mean you need to let loose um, some friends and family, so be it. Um, number two is do not fall into the group mentality of acting like other crabs. You don't want to fall into group think of so-and-so didn't deserve that promotion or Kevin thinks he's so damn smart and he's not that smart. Do not let that be you. Don't waste your time or your mentality with, with that type of, of thought process. I want you to hold yourself to a higher standard. And the idea of holding yourself to a higher standard is a perfect segue to my next lesson. The sixth lesson on my list is you have an obligation. So everyone participating in this virtual seminar is special and unique and, and has plans for success or else you wouldn't be investing your time here with work ethic and holding yourself accountable and not letting others around you or society get in your head and label you, you will be successful. And as the, the late great Stan Lee wrote in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. This means you know, as, as you progress in your career, um, as you become more successful, you will have an obligation um, to help others. Um, you will have an obligation to mentor other people of color, other women, other people in underrepresented groups on how to become successful, how to leverage lessons that you have learned so that they can catapult themselves further, faster. In fact, that is why I'm here. I am here because I feel obligated and not in the negative sense or the connotation of the word obligation, but in the positive sense of the word. I've been blessed with great mentors and I've had a lot of success and I wanna pass my knowledge on to you so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. This is my obligation as a successful person from an underrepresented class. So when you approach obligation from the positive sense, recognize that you are helping individuals and you are helping the whole. And that's what it's all about. This brings me to um, my fifth career lesson that I've learned. And that is create your own personal board of directors. So the Harvard Business Review writes, the board of directors is the most important function or the board of directors most important function is to approve or send back for amendment management's recommendations about the future direction of the corporation. So why would I suggest that you have a personal board of directors and what do I mean? In lesson seven, I already cautioned you against crabs in the bucket, not surrounding yourself with people who are not supportive of your success. The board of directors concept is actually kind of like the mirror image of that lesson. In this concept, you are purposefully surrounding yourself with people who have a genuine interest in your success. By creating a board of directors, you are a corporation and you need key people around you who, who will help guide you or prove the path that you're on and who will tell you when you're off course and help you rethink your strategy. This personal board of directors has to be of, comprised of people who, who know you well, people that you respect enough, people who are smart enough to be able to reorient you when you lose direction a bit or you get off course. And trust me, that'll happen. It happens to all of us and that's okay. But that's why it is important that you surround yourself with the right type of people. The people on your board of directors need to be comprised of people with, with different skill sets and in different stages of their own journey. For example, you're gonna want people on your board who are career mentors, people who can give you great business guidance. You'll want um, a type of person who's a financial advisor on your board, someone who can coach you through building wealth, not just making money. Um, you'll want a religious or a spiritual type of, of advisor on your board, someone who will help you maintain who you are as you are growing and evolving and help you stay true to your North Star. 
So you need to surround yourself with, 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 with quality people. As you're starting off in your career, think of it like this. You're really like a startup company looking to IPO. That means you need to surround yourself with people who have done this before people who have already been successful and have knowledge, people who have who are invested in your success and are willing to share their knowledge with you. The fourth lesson on my list is run your own race. In many ways, this lesson is companion to the first lesson I spoke about related to you are not on the label. Um, just as I did not allow myself to be defined of, uh, defined by the label woman or African-American, in the same regard, I recognize that my path to success, to happiness, to fulfillment is different from anyone else's. I am running my own race. And in this race, my competition is myself. Myself from yesterday, myself from a year ago, myself from five years ago. And in this race, I am on my own course. That means I try not to let myself get you know, wrapped around the axle about what people typically do, what is standard, what is normal. It was in my, my late high school, early college, um, those experiences that really taught me this lesson. The typical college race or path, if you will, is that you graduate high school, you apply and enter college, you go for four years of college, and then you graduate. That was the race that I had expected to run, to run. But as it turns out, that was not my course. I started off at Boston University and two semesters into college, you know, my father um, stopped making financial payments toward my college because he had a terminal illness. Um, but I was unaware that my tuition was not being paid. As a result, I was administratively withdrawn um, from BU due to non-payment. Um, my older brother had this phrase. His phrase is, you've got to be smarter than the problem. So we figured out the solution to get me through school without having the financial means at the time was that I had to become an independent of the state of Massachusetts. That meant neither, neither of my parents could claim me on their taxes for a year and I had to work. Um, so after a little bit over a year and after I was independent of the state of, Ma of state of Massachusetts, at that point, I applied to Harvard University and I was accepted. I was working full time during the day and I went to school full time at night. It took me every bit of a full five and a half years to graduate college. If I was running the standard college race, I should have graduated in four, in four years. So like by definition, I didn't do so good on that race. But as it turns out, I was not running the standard race. I was running my own race and I won my race. I graduated cum laude from Harvard and I cherished that degree so much because it was so hard fought. So really the moral of this lesson is, you are on your own path. You are running your own race. Recognize that and measure yourself based on that. This story really exemplifies um, the third lesson on my list, and that is perseverance. Merriam Webster defines perseverance as continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failure, or opposition. It's the action or the condition or an instance of persevering, steadfastness. As I look back on my college experience and, and wonder how I even got through that phase, um, one, one thing comes to mind and that is perseverance. I wish I could tell you that throughout this process, I had been strong and, and positive and fearless, um, but, but I'd be lying. There were plenty of times when I felt defeated. I felt less than, I felt like I wanted to give up. And it was in those times that I had my mom's constant encouragement, that encouragement coupled with my own inner voice that I called perseverance, told me to keep moving, to don't stop, keep moving forward. It was almost like Dory from that Disney movie, Finding Nemo, 
where she says, keep swimming, keep swimming. That is the mindset that I was in. So many of you might be going through some significant challenges right now, or as you embark on your your career journeys or your journey into adulthood, I'll tell you, there will be bumps in the road. There will be challenges, some of which will feel oppressive and insurmountable. In these times, remember this lesson, keep moving forward. With perseverance, you can get through anything. So this brings us to number two on my top 10 career and life lessons list. Lesson number two is you are not an imposter. As students, how many times have you entered a discussion, um, a lecture hall, a party, and felt like, I don't belong here? You know, as an African-American woman in business, um, there have been plenty of times when I felt like I didn't belong. You know, as I sat there in meetings and, you know, the guy next to me is speaking over me or is saying the exact same thing that I just said as if I hadn't said it. In these types of scenarios, it's really easy for one to feel like an imposter. And there's actually an, an official name for this, and it's called imposter syndrome. Harvard Business Review um, defines imposter syndrome as this, a collection of feelings of inadequacies that despite that persists despite evident success. Here's the lesson, like, Here's the lesson on not to feel like an imposter. And this lesson is, is closely aligned to the previous lesson that I shared. When you have not allowed yourself to be defined by a label, when you have a strong work ethic and you hold yourself personally accountable, when you run your own race, by definition, you are not an imposter. When you do those things, you have every right to be present and heard and respected and valued and promoted and celebrated because you earned it. Do not let crabs in your bucket. Do not let society or even your own inner thoughts sabotage your thinking, sabotage you into believing that you are an imposter because you are not. This lesson is just that simple. And alas, this brings me to my number one, uh, to number one on my career and life lessons list. And this is the most important lesson of them all. And that is the phrase, there will be beauty from ashes. Now the phrase itself um, is a biblical phrase, but don't let that put you off because this lesson is not related to religion per se. In both my, my personal life and in my career, the best growth and the most amazing opportunities have come from circumstances where I felt like my life was burning down and just turning to ash. You know, one such example, I spoke of early, earlier, getting kicked out of Boston University for financial reasons. At the time, that was horribly embarrassing, only to be quickly followed up by, you know, learning that my father had a terminal illness. That phase was sad and frustrating and had me feeling somewhat helpless. I mentioned that, you know, that during that time, I had to go to, I had to, you know, to go to school and I had to work full time. My older brother's girlfriend was working at a cool tech startup company. And through her, I got a job as a receptionist. I was not working the phones for very long before I was promoted into their production department. And I got exposure to all different areas of the business. And I got to meet and hang out with technology salespeople. And at that time, neither they nor I realized the imprint they were putting on my mind. I then went to work for another cool tech startup company. You know, fun fact, this company's supercomputer was featured in the movie Jurassic Park. I then went to work for another cool tech company. Um, this company had uh, was a key contributor um, to the precursor of the internet. So because of my father's illness and because of getting booted from, from college initially, you know, I got exposed to careers in technology and specifically technology sales that I would not have even dreamed of. 
Had none of those traumatic events happened, I am 100% confident that I would not be here speaking with you today. I am 100% confident that I would not be in the middle of an amazing technology sales career and reaping all the benefits that that career entails. Had my life not, you know, metaphorically burned down to ash, I would not have the beautiful life that I am living now. So my lesson for you is this. When things are bad, when they are really, really bad, fear not, because given enough time, you will see growth and opportunity and beauty from those ashes. So that's that's it. That is 23 years of tech sales, uh, of my life lessons, distilled in 30 minutes and 10 life lessons. So let's recap these life lessons. Lesson number 10. You are more than a label. Lesson nine, have incredible work ethic. Lesson number eight, your most valuable resource is your time. Lesson seven, beware of crabs in the bucket. Lesson six, you have an obligation. Lesson five, create your own personal board of directors. Lesson four, run your own race. Lesson three, perseverance. Lesson two, you are not an imposter. In lesson one, the number one lesson is there will be beauty for ashes. Thank you very much, the National Sales Network, for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. And I wish you all the very best in your career endeavors. And remember, MongoDB is hiring.